Good morning, everyone. This is Doug. I'm going to do a book review or a book excerpt review from a book entitled Jesus Really Said That? Five Teachings of Jesus Often Missed, Ignored, or Rejected by Gary Miller. That's he and his wife. They live, uh, well, I'll give you a little bio biography of them. About the author, Gary Miller was raised in California and today lives with his wife, Patty, and family in the Pacific Northwest. Gary works with the poor in developing countries and directs the SALT Microfinance Solutions Program for Christian Aid Ministries. This program offers business and spiritual teaching to those living in chronic poverty, provides small loans, sets up local village savings groups, gives agricultural teaching, and assists them in learning how to use their God-given resources to become sustainable. sustainable. Which, by the way, I'm, I'm uh, hoping also that you'll see how Christians apply Christ's message, not just to worry about, you know, there's war over here, there's war over there, but actually do something for the poor. And he seems to be committed to this uh, in the Pacific Northwest. So it'll be very interesting to see how uh, his focus also have had him refocus on what Jesus teaches. Uh, now, here is a Kindle edition summary. And I, as I recall, I, again, I, I bought this just a couple of weeks ago. I think it was 3 or $4, so it's really not expensive. Uh, look at the ratings. He's got four and a half uh, uh, stars on 16 ratings. Uh, Jared, now, the story is a, has a plot. It's more of a plot story that then te is used for a teaching example. So it starts this way. Jeremy and Alicia enjoy attending Lakeside Believers Fellowship. The sermons are gripping, the program's exciting, and the worship team is second to none. Without question, Lakeside is the place to be. But there is one problem. Jeremy and Alicia have never paid much attention to what Jesus actually taught. So when I read that, I had to go, My, this has to be a fantastic coincidence that I opened up this book online. Anyway, many people think they understand Christianity. They believe that a man named Jesus came to earth a couple thousand years ago, died on a cross, and arose from the dead. They believe that accepting these facts makes them Christians and allow them to go to a place called heaven when they die. Yes, that's what most people believe. And that's not what Jesus taught about himself. And that's not how you go to heaven according to Jesus. You know, you got to forgive to be forgiven. You've got to uh, give to the poor, the parable of the sheep and the goats. But none of these things are taught because somebody else came along and interfered with them. But that's Doug. Let's listen to this guy, Gary Miller. That, so then he says this, that is what Jeremy and Alicia thought Christianity consisted of too, until they began to look at what Jesus really said. Let's go follow them on this journey. Now, the, what we're going to do here, I don't know if you can see all of these three panels, but this is my Kindle view. Okay, so my Kindle book is in the middle. My notes about the Kindle are on the right and the table of contents are on the left so that I can move around and, and then talk to you. So uh, keep your eyes focused in the middle, but I'm going to myself be using the highlights on the right to keep track of what I previously noted earlier and I highlighted in, in yellow. Uh, now, there, he's going a little bit through the buildup of the story. Uh, after returning from home from the military and marrying Alicia, his high school sweetheart, Jeremy's life had spun out of control. National superiority, the great truth that he had leaned on, had let him down. As he's talking about the military industrial complex, we all are we all are raised to serve and, and bless and hope and pray that we conquer the world or control it. <laughs> and Alicia had looked on I'm joking. And Alicia had looked on with dismay as Jeremy struggled. She watched him turn to alcohol and finally drugs, attempting to relieve his disillusionment. Okay. So anyway, that's shows you this couple have actual real problems and they're trying to solve them. Let's keep going here. Uh, now, he says this, Jeremy smiled as he listened to Pastor Mike's enthusiastic welcome. So now he's going to a church, you know, trying to get out of this uh, maelstrom he's in. This is why our church is so large and continues to grow. He thought people need to feel good about themselves and understand that God loves them. I'm glad we have a pastor who understands how people feel and want to make their worship experience enjoyable and even fun. And this is a theme of the whole book, I think, is we all want to go to church to just have fun. We're not there to learn how to go do ministry to actual people outside of the church. No, we're just there to listen, be indoctrinated, and then don't do anything with it except be nice to the people in the church and abuse with us. And it's an inactive faith. It's a faith that doesn't do anything that Jesus tells you to do. <laughs> And, and that's sad that the church actually derails you from things. And I'm just going to throw my two cents in. When I was a young Christian man, an attorney, I went to a church and I was uh, 
hoping uh, that it would turn out wonderful. It was named, it was, it was called a Christian church. That's the denomination, Christian church. And, uh, and but it has a name in front of it. I think it was Westwood Hills Christian Church. And, uh, you know, I tried to get involved in the ministries to help the poor, the needy, all this kind of stuff. And they only believed you study these things. You actually don't go out and do them. And the minute I got the, I was the head of the, I was the chairman of the Christian Action Committee. And when I did something I thought was normal, you know, hey, let's go out and feed the homeless in the, uh, at Santa, Man Santa Monica Park. I got my hand slapped and told, don't ever do that again. You need our permission. What, what was What was so wrong is I allegedly helped the, Methodists also do it. So we were helping the Methodists in the same ministry because they were already there. What, what are we going to do? Squeeze them out and move them around? This is the kind of the world Christianity lives in, in the real world, is it pushed, it, it just it has to be exclusively the only one who's, if, if there is any ministry outside of it, it has to be approved by a stamp. And if you do any ministry outside, you see the what are the risks are, that are so horrible as you might end up helping Methodists who don't hold our exact tenets, whatever those are, and, and that's, I got slapped on the hand. So I just said to myself, no more, I'm not going to help if this is, if I can't do uh, Christian work for, for the poor. And apparently I was supposed to just keep reading magazines from that the pastor had provided me. And they're nice people, don't get me wrong, but it didn't make any sense to me. But anyway, that's just to show you, I have a common beef. That All right, so let's jump a little bit ahead. If Jesus were a pastor in America today, the young man's asking, what would his church look like? Would he be like Pastor Mike, attempting to help each person feel good about his or her church experience? Or would he give some message so serious and challenging that many seekers would never return? <sighs> Jeremy felt a trickle of sweat tracing its way down his back. It was unsettling feeling, similar to what he had experienced in Iraq when he first was having doubts about his military involvement. He had seen, been so sure that America was right. Was he wrong about Jesus as well? How well did he really know Jesus? As a history lover, Jeremy thoroughly enjoyed research, but he started to dig. But if he started to dig, would he like what he found? Anyway, uh, I just got so thinking about the difference between Pastor Mike and Jesus. Jesus seemed to be preaching things that repelled people, and I realized today that Pastor Mike would never do that. So he came to realize th th the church will never give you a message that you have to do something that that would want you to go the other way. They're going to give you stuff that you only will accept and do, but never give you a challenge to do something more brave and more vigorous. And that's exactly what I was tr trying to tell you with that Christian action committee I was put in charge of. And then the minute you do anything that has any Christian action to it is is not what they intended. They wanted it just to read books with us, fellow Christians in a, in a committee. That doesn't make any sense, but that's what that's what Christianity had become. Just, you know, that was a church in uh, the area of UCLA. And most of the kids that I was dealing with, I'm an older attorney, maybe I'm 29 or something like that. And the young people there are in their 20s, young 20s, and so on. So they just graduated UCLA, most of them. So that, that was a great place to be, I thought, and, and, you know, wholesome setting, wholesome Christian setting. And and then I'm confronted by the fact that being a Christian didn't require you to actually do anything to help people. Oh, it was horrible. All right, so back to the saga of Jeremy and Alicia. Alicia gets upset with Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy, that that isn't fair. Look how much good Pastor Mike and Lakeside are doing and how they have blessed us. Jesus lived in a completely different time of culture. We have no idea how he would preach today. You're right, Alicia, Jeremy responds, but I have been having some doubts. We have been blessed, and I appreciate Pastor Mike, but I want to take a closer look at the words and life of Jesus. I feel I don't understand him or his message very well. I feel like I was misled by patriotism in the military, and I don't want to be hoodwinked again. They were silent the rest of the way home as both focused on their fears. Alicia was fearful that this brief but pleasant interlude in their married life was coming to an end, and Jeremy that he had committed to something that might be hollow at its core. Arriving home, dinner was forgotten, but from their continued discussion, their ultimate, they ultimately arrived at a consensus. They agreed on three points. They would pray fervently for direction as they started looking closely at the teachings of Jesus. What a great idea. <laughs> Jeremy would research the early church and try to get a picture of how the early Christians interpreted Jesus' words. Another fantastic idea. Three, they would continue to be part of and an encouragement to Lakeside Believers Fellowship while they searched for truth. So they didn't have to abandon the church they were going to. They were going to learn truth independent of the church. Good idea. 
So Jeremy started where I think we all would, Matthew. And he's going to ask the question about Jesus. Who was he and what was his primary message? And he finds out the Sermon on the Mount is very interesting. The Sermon on the Mount was chock full of powerful statements. Why hadn't he noticed them before? Jeremy tried to read as though he had never seen the material before. He noted verses where Jesus warned against lust and where he stressed the, perform the permanence of marriage. He wondered what Jesus meant by saying a person should never swear or when he said we should give to everyone who asks. He jotted down the reference where Jesus commanded his followers to love their enemies. What could all this mean? How could a person put all this into practice and still survive in the world? He would need to give more thought to this. On the second morning, Jeremy came across a verse that stopped him in his tracks. It was just a little passage, but somehow reading it as though Jesus were actually speaking directly to him made the verse come alive, and the theological implications shook him to his core. It was, the, it was at the end of the Lord's Prayer, and it simply said, But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Jesus was clearly saying that forgiveness... Jeremy's forgiveness was conditional. Let's just click that button, number six, just so we can see it. It's Matthew 6, verse 15. Unless Jeremy was willing to forgive others' sins towards him, God wasn't going to forgive him either. Jeremy was shocked. Yeah, that's not a faith alone doctrine, is it? If there was one thing Jeremy had been taught at Lakeside Believers Fellowship, it was that salvation and forgiveness of sins was by faith alone in Jesus Christ. Every Sunday, Pastor Mike in some way emphasized that a man's salvation was dependent only upon that man's faith in Jesus. God knew we couldn't live good enough to earn our salvation, and Jesus came to cover over our righteous unrighteousness with his righteousness. All a man needed to do was receive Jesus into his heart, and from that point on, the blood of Jesus covered his life. No need to forgive anyone. This had been made clear when Jeremy received as a member at Lakeside, and yet Jesus was saying something entirely different. If I choose to not forgive someone, even though I say I believe in Jesus, I will not be forgiven? Question mark. Jeremy sat back in his chair and looked out the window. Oh, the sun was just coming up and he wouldn't need to leave for work soon. But this little verse was unsettling. Salvation is conditional? Was he understanding it correctly? Weren't there other verses in the Bible that said all that a man needed to do was receive Jesus into his heart? Or was it possible that obedience could be an important, vital requirement? Heading off to work, Jeremy continued to think about this question, and that evening he began searching the scriptures in earnest. He was astounded at what he found. Repeatedly, Jesus emphasized that he was much more interested in what a man did than his state of belief. Jesus often talked about the importance of a man's works. Jeremy did a word search on the familiar phrase that he heard each Sunday, quote, we are saved by faith alone. To his great astonishment, he couldn't find the phrase anywhere in the Bible. Even That's true, by the way. Even more surprisingly, the only passage he found using similar words said just the opposite. And that's also true. In the book of James, a writer concluded a discourse on the topic of faith and works by saying, quote, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. And I can tell you where you'd find that. That's James chapter 2, verse 24. Jeremy had thought that human works were a bad thing, something people with poor doctrine did in a vain attempt to be saved. But as he went from reference to reference, he repeatedly found obedience as something good, an obvious identifier of those who are born again. Somehow, Jeremy had come to believe that good works were a denial of Christ's victory on the cross. But it was clear that Jesus and his apostles taught something completely different. But the real stunner came at the end of 7th chapter of Matthew. After all those difficult commands in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said that many who thought he was their Lord would receive a tremendous shock on the Day of Judgment. This is one of the most important passages Christians need, and it's right there, right after the Sermon on the Mount. It's Matthew 7, 21, 23. Oh, good. Alicia, come here. Have you ever thought about this verse? Jesus says that many people will come to him on Judgment Day and feel confident they are saved. They will believe they've had a genuine relationship with Christ and had worked for him. But Jesus will say he didn't even know them. They're waiting breakfast forgotten. They read on it on as Jesus told a, story, a little story explaining who they, these surprised people will be. He told of two men who had built houses. The first dug down deep and built a, uh, his house on a rock. When the storm came, his house stood firm because it was anchored to a rock. Jesus said this builder is like a man who hears what Jesus says and goes out to do it. But the second man built his house on sand, and when the floodwaters rose and the wind blew, his house was demolished. Jesus said this builder is like a man who hears his teachings but doesn't obey them.
Let's just take a second to look at Jesus' words. John, Matthew 7, verse 24 to 27, he's talking about those who hear his sayings and do that, does them. And, and therefore, when the rain and floods come, his house will not fall because it's found on the rock. But then everyone who hears these sayings of mine, listening to Jesus and does not do them, is doing the right thing because you just are saved by faith alone. No, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended, the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was his fall. That's what happens when you don't depend your life on what following what Jesus teaches you to do. Jeremy and Alicia sat in stunned silence. They both remembered singing about this account in Sunday school, but had never noticed the powerful import of what Jesus was saying. Finally, Alicia spoke in a subdued voice. So Jesus is saying that those who don't live out what he taught will be surprised on the day of judgment? Turning to the back of his Bible, Jeremy pointed to a passage he had found earlier. Quote, yes, according to what we're finding, this passage agrees with the, the verse regarding the judgment. Listen to this. And I saw the dead, the small and the great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, but by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. And if you want to know where footnote 9 is, it is down here, Revelation 20, verses 12 to 13. Jeremy turned a page in his notepad. Across the top, he wrote, questions for Pastor Mike. And then he started a list. One, if a man's works do not matter, then why does the Bible say we will be judged by them? Matthew 1, excuse me, number 1, Matthew 5, verse 28. 2, Matthew 5, verse 31 to 32. 3, Matthew 5, 33 to 37. 4, Matthew 5, verse 42. 5, Matthew 5, verse 43 to 47. 6, Matthew 6, verse 15. 7, James 2, 24. We read that earlier. 8, Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Revelation 20, verses 12 to 13. That's nine passages, my friend. Overwhelming point. Okay, I'm going to stop, stop here at chapter 4, and we'll pick up from here. Uh, and I can hope you all will be excited to continue to listen, because the questions that, that Jeremy and Alicia are asking each other and intend to ask their pastor, Mike, are important questions that if you're as a similar church, you need to ask these hard questions and say, hey, what about this stuff? This is not what stuff. You're not teaching us any of this stuff. There's nine passages on works and we're going to be judged by our works. Well, I wasn't told that. I was told we're going to be judged by faith alone. All right. So we'll look for the next episode. These are hard questions that uh, Jeremy and Alicia are asking and let's find out where it's going to end up.